Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, okay, we we'll begin our class. How is everyone? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay, we will begin our class with our dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Anyone needs a copy? You need a copy? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We'll start from the second page. Eh? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi fi kulli lahtatin abada ala dan ni'amillahi afdalihi. Allahumma atina min ladunka rahmah wa alimna min ladunka ilmah. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Nawaitu ta'allumu wa ta'alim wal mudhakkara wa tazkir wal naf'a wal intifa' wal ifadah wal istifadah wal hath ala tamassuki bi kitabillahi wa sunnati rasulillahi sallallahu alaihi wa sallam wa du'a ila al-huda wa dalalah ala al-khair ibtigha'a wajhillah wa maradatihi wa qurbihi wa thawabihi subhanahu wa ta'ala ma'alutin wa afiatin bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma alhimna ilman nafqahu bihi awamiraka wa nawahiyaka warzuqna fahman na'arifu bihi kaifan najika ya arhamar rahimin Allahumma inna nas'aluka fahman nabiyin wa hifzal mursalin wa ilham al-malaikat al-muqarrabin fi afiyati ya arhamar rahimin Allahumma aghna bil'ilm wa zayyina bil'ilm wa akrimna bil'taqwa wa jamilna bil'afiyah ya arhamar rahimin amin wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma inna nastawdi'uka ma qara'nahu wa ma naqra'ahu fi hana al-majlis wa ma qablahu ma ba'dah fahfazhu alayna hatta taruduhu ilayna waqta ihtiyajina ilayhi ya arhamar rahimin اللهم أكرمنا بنور الفهم وأخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وافتح لنا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا حكمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم يا مقاليد الأمور كلها بيده وإليه يرجع الأمور كلها يا فتاح يا عالم يا فتاح يا عالم يا فتاح يا عالم افتح علينا فتحا قريبا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لصدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي وسد لساني وهدي قلبي وفعل كذلك بأحبابي أبدا ورزقنا كمال الفتوح العارف والفقه في الدين ما كمال الإخلاص والصدق واليقين والعافية والغنى والنصر والحفظ والنفع والانتفاء وخير الدارين وعلوم الأول والآخر آمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الفاتحة Okay, everyone, so now just mention your own intentions as to uh, why you uh, are attending this class. Eh? Right, just quietly to yourself. Alright, alhamdulillah. Okay. So we are okay, we, we, we finished the death the, the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mother, right? Last week. Right. So we went into um, the story 
right, as to uh, his mother passing away and he was present, right, watching her die. And we mentioned that, you know, this happened in a place called Abwa. Right, so Abwa is a place between Mecca and Medina at that time. And they were, can you just like turn the fan um, not to point at me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, so... Um, let's just say that. Right, so they were actually on their way back, right, from Medina, going back to Mecca, and it was just him, his mother, and there was a slave girl who was assisting the mother, right, and her name was Baraka, right. So the mother fell sick along the way, right, and she passed away, right. So it was only Baraka and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right, who were who were there, right, at the death of his mother, and they dug the grave for her, and they buried her, right. So at six years old, he went back to Mecca. Right now, uh, fatherless and motherless. Right, yes, he is now a complete orphan. Right, so in in Malay we say yatim piatu lah. Right, so he's completely without parents at this point. Uh, uh, Baraka brings him back, and yeah, the slave girl Baraka. Right, and she and he and we mentioned a bit about her last last week. I actually want to mention more about her. Right, because she plays a very very strong role in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, she was from. You mentioned a bit about her. Just re- uh, recap. She was from his. Uh, grandfather, right? She was uh, she was owned by the grandfather in the time of slavery, right? Uh, and she was a very young girl, right? So when the, when Sayyidina Abdullah, the father of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was married off to Sayyidina Amina, she was gifted right, as a gift to Abdullah. She was she was property of Abdullah, right? She was a girl, right, who was very well treated in the family of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and very well loved by them, right? She was like their own daughter. Right, so she's from uh, Abyssinia originally. She's a black girl, right? From Abyssinia, she was sold into slavery, right? In uh, in the Arabian uh, Peninsula at that time, right? And of course, she was bought right by the best of families, right? Which is the grandfather of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she was treated like a child to them, right? She would help around the house, right? She would you know do uh, tasks around the house like a, like a like a servant, right? Uh, but she was she was beloved to them, right? Because she was known for her for her gentleness. She was known for her uh, sincerity, right, and also for her charm, right. She was charming, right. So she was at the age around twelve, around there, younger, right, whereby she entered the household of Abdullah, right, uh, the father of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right. And then uh, Sayyidina Abdullah passes. So he he the the day they got married, he went off for a trip, and he dies on his trip, right. So when the mother is pregnant, uh, when when the mother is two months pregnant with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So she was there the entire time. So she was basically the support right, for the mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She was there to be with her throughout the pregnancy. Right? So so especially when she felt sad and she felt lonely without her husband around. So you can see her role eh, this uh Sayyidina Baraka. Right? She played a very very strong role in the fir- in the early parts of Islam, right? Very very strong. Right? And she would live through the entire thing and she would even live longer. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? So she has very, very high station, right, in paradise and in the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So uh, uh, when Rasulullah was born, of course, he was very beloved to her, right, and she treated him like a son, right, and she is in fact his property because uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam inherits her from her, from his father, right. So she was, if we can do, so she was, uh, right, so she was. Uh, the property of Abdullah, right? So now Abdullah has passed away. So now Abdullah has passed away. Now the property of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And she looked after him when she was he was a baby, right? Till when he, you know, came back was in a halima, right? After witnessing for two years, uh, four years in fact, right? At four years old, so she was very very close to him, and she loved him deeply, right? So and she would always watch out for him, follow him wherever he went, right? So you know she, you know, basically she was really you know attached to him very very much, right? And like a mother, right? a mother to a boy, yeah, to a son. So when his mother passed away, right, she was the one who took him, right, carried him onto the camel and brought him back to uh, Mecca. Right. And she stayed with him. Right. She did not leave him at this point. Right. She stayed with him right, as he grew up in the household of Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather. So now we are in the household of Abdul Muttalib. Right? And in the house, and in, in, in Zain Abdul Muttalib, right, the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right, he was the chief right, of the Meccans at that time. Right? He was a believer in one God. Right? We know that all of Rasulullah's ancestors, they are believers in the one true God. Right? He, right, he knew that his, his grandson had, there was something special right, about his grandson, this little boy 
who lost both his parents at six years old. Right? He knew very well because there have been people who, who came up to him to tell him, and we went through the stories of the number of people who told him, right, that in your loins, I mean, in your descendants, there will be the last prophet, the final prophet. So there have been people who have been telling him this right, throughout you know, this, all this time. So he knew that this boy has a very great affair. Right? And we mentioned last week that you know, he used to have his own like, mattress next to the Kaaba. Right, whereby the, the shade of the Kaaba will fall onto his mattress. And no one, not even his own children, are allowed to sit with him on his mattress. He's the he's the king, la. he's the he's a leader right, of the people, the, the chief of the people. Right. But he allowed his little grandson, right, since he's old, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, to sit with him on his mattress. And when the people tried to stop the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam from sitting there on the mattress, right? He would tell them, "Don't stop him! Don't stop him!" Right? Because this grandson of mine, you, he's only six years old. Like you see him as only six years old, but this grandson of mine, he has a great destiny. Right? He has a great affair, right? and he would not allow people to take his grandson away from him. So even when they come to him to discuss important, you know, adult matters. Like about the community, about society, about economies and whatsoever, right? He would not let them chase away the small boy, right? The small boy sits in all our meetings, right? So, you know, like he won't like tell him to go off and play. He would keep him right next to him. So Rasulullah Sassam himself relates right, that he was eight years old. So he was with his grandfather for two years. He was eight years old when his grandfather passes away, right? So and he remembered that day. Right, that his grandfather passed away. Right, so basically it was from old age. Right, that he passed away, and Rasulullah remembered that the entire, uh, the entire of Mecca. Right, came out for the funeral of the grandfather. Right, so you see, he's not even eight years old at this point. Right, and he's already faced, you know, the death of his father, his mother, his grandfather, right? and all of whom, you know, that like he was very close to his mother, and he was very close to his, uh, grandfather. Right, they, he was always with them. Right, so this this are things that uh, he had to go through. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Rasulullah says in the hadith that the most beloved of you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the most tested of you. Right? And no one had more difficult tests right, than the prophets themselves. And right? the prophets had very, very difficult tests in their lives. So now he moves now he is uh, taken in by his uncle, Abu Talib. And you mentioned about his care under his uncle, Abu Talib. So Abu Talib, he is actually the full brother of Abdullah, who is the father of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Right, so because he's the full brother, right, he was, at, he was uh, in a sense, told, right, by uh, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather, to look after this boy. Right, look out, guard over him with your life. Right, he was told to do that. Right, so this because. Um, the grandfather knows that this boy is going to be some, someone very, very special. And he also knows that there are going to be people who will try to kill this boy. Right? So he told Ab- uh, Abu Talib, guard this boy with your life. Right? He is now under your care. Right? Guard him with your life. So Abu Talib, right, he will look after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam right, more than he would with his, own, with his own children. And he had many, 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 many children. Right? So he was a very poor man. Because right, you're just wondering, you know, of all the uncles that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had, and he had many uncles, right? So you know, and he he had more than ten uncles. Of all the uncles, and he had uncles who were rich. Of all the uncles, Abu Talib was entrusted, and he was a very poor man with many children, right? So you know, one more child in the household is not going to be on the outward. It's not going to be easy, right? But you will see that it will become very easy, right? On the outward, like say in the Halima's case. So in the Halima also, on the outward, to take this orphan boy without any pay, right, and to breastfeed him for two full years. On the outward, it seemed like something like, you know, and we are facing drought and famine, and I'm starving, my child's starving, my goats have no milk. Right? On the outward, it seems like the most ridiculous thing to do, right, to actually take one more child right, into the household. Right? It's just like, you know, it's, it's beyond your, your imagination. It's something that you would think, no, no, I can't do that. Right? That would be irresponsible. Right, you might think right, that way. Right? But he was, but we see you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places blessings wherever he wants to place his blessings. And with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah placed the most of his blessings, overwhelming, overflowing blessings from him. So Abu Talib, right, he was entrusted with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
and the Prophet Muhammad entered his household as a boy of eight years old. Right. And the and the events, you know, that happened in the household of Abu Talib, right, was you know so you know, amazing that his Abu Talib's children would relate, right, and they would say that we were we were a family you know, of many, right, many 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 children in this family, right, and our father Abu Talib he was very poor, right, he didn't have much to give us. So usually when they came to eat together, right, and they'll have one like large tray or large plate, and everyone would eat from that uh, plate, right? And they say usually when we came together to eat, right, we will finish the food really quickly, and we will still be very hungry, right, because it's so little food, you know, so little food, food on the plate itself. So they would share all the food, that all the children, and right? they would gather around, and they would eat all the food. Then they said, the day Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the day he came into our household, right, we realized with the same amount of food, same amount of food, that whenever we sat around the plate and he was with us sitting around the plate, we could eat and eat and eat and eat to our fill. Right? And there will be some left. Right? So, and it's, it's the same amount of food. Right? But it seemed like it was never ending. <laughs> right? And we noticed that when he was not there, Right, the food will finish quickly and you'll be hungry. <laughs> and, 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 and it will happen every single time. Right? And, and, and it happened to the point whereby they would just make him sit there, even though he doesn't want to eat. <laughs> they would just make him sit there because you know by him sitting there, the food will not finish. <laughs> right? so, and Abu Talib, like, even since there are relations where Abu Talib himself reprimanded his children, right? you're using him, <laughs> putting him there and then letting him sit there. Okay, sit there. <laughs> Let us eat. Right, so you know, because they saw that blessings descended right, on the food right, and caused it to be, you know, uh, abundant without them even they don't even see how abundant it is. The blessings are uh, are descending, and so in Aisha, and this happened. This happened many times in the life of Rasulullah SAW. Many, many, many times. Right, this uh, endless food, <laughs> right, uh, miracle. Right, it happened when the when the companions of the Prophet Muhammad SAW they were once at war. Right, and they were they were actually not at war, but they were um, what do you call it, encircled right by the enemy. That's a that's a name for it in English. Siege, siege yes. Right, they were sieged by the enemy. Right, so they were, and it, this this lasted for you know quite some time, and they were not allowed to come out of the city. Right, so everyone in there, in even the the city was was now starving. Right, they were very very hungry. Right, and they said they, they were so hungry they used to tie stones around their stomachs, right, to prevent their stomachs from growling, right? Because you know it's so much hunger they will actually pl- press a stone as if so as to make the stomach smaller, <laughs> right? So so that it will not growl from hunger. And they were complaining to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying that at that time lah, this is many years later, right? That, where they will say, you know, O oh, Prophet Muhammad, that like, we are we are hungry, we're very very hungry. Right? And he would lift his shirt and they would see he has two stones right, tied, tied to his stomach. Right? He is also suffering from hunger. Right? So there was, and, and one, of the, one of the companions actually saw what happened. Right? And he said to the Prophet Muhammad, and he whispered, he said that, I have some food in my house. Right? I, I want to invite you and just a few people. Because I only have a bit of food, not so much. I can't feed the entire army. Just, I just like, you know, just a very small amount of wheat, right? And just some meat, enough for you and some people whom you want to invite. Right? And he whispered this to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And the Prophet Muhammad turned around and he announced to the whole army, right, saying that Jabir, the, 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 the sahabah's name, the company's name was Jabir, Jabir has invited all of you to his house right, for, <laughs> for dinner. So everyone is hungry, right? Everyone is starving. And they were, they were rejoicing, like, oh, we have dinner invitation now. And Jabi was like, yeah, so no, no, I don't have enough food. I only have like that. How am I going to feed? And they say it was about 300 people there. How am I going to feed all of these people? Right? And then the Prophet Muhammad said, don't worry. Go and prepare the food. But do not take out the food from its uh, pot until I come. He said that. He just said that. Right, do not take the food out of the pot until I come. So, okay, he said, like, okay, let's go, let's do this. <laughs> right, he went home, he told his wife, and the wife freaked out also. The wife was like, what? <laughs> you didn't tell him how much food we had. <laughs> and he said, I told him, but he invited everybody. <laughs> then the wife said, okay, okay, this is what he says. Okay, we're just going to cook. And they already had like a, a handful, that was it. Right, we just cook what we have, right? And we 
you know, wait for him to come. Right, so they cook what they had, and it was for, for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to come. Right, he came into the kitchen, right, and he stirred. Right, the they made like a like soup, right, and then the the bread dough, right, he touched the bread bread dough, and then he said to the to the wife, bake the bread. Right, take take bits out of the dough and keep break, baking it. Right, baking the bread, and then the 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 soup. Right, he himself, the Prophet Muhammad, he would scoop it out. Right, the rest of you just sit down. <laughs> so and and he said, you know, that he kept scooping and scooping and scooping and scooping, and everyone came, you know, for seconds, and that, and they kept eating and eating, and no one looked into the pot, no one looked into the pot, right? But he kept just said, he just kept kept coming, right? And then the wife was saying, you know, I kept taking the dough out to make bread when I came back, you know, I take more dough, but the dough never finished, right? You know, it just it just didn't finish right? until everybody was full. Right, so Subhanallah. So it's just you know, it's like many many stories, many stories uh, of the Prophet Muhammad having this, uh, is of his miracles. Right, it is, I can go into like so many stories yeah, of this kind of like you know. There's one story also that I always mention one more story of Abu Huraira, and Abu Huraira, he uh, he was very hungry one day. Very, he's one of those people who live in the mosque. Yeah, he live in the he lives in the mosque, so he. Um, he's, he, basically, they're considered to be homeless companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right? There are there's a group of companions later on. It's later on. I'm going to go back and track into this story. Right? But later on, right? There are a group of companions who came to Medina to study the religion, and they are actually very poor and they are homeless. In fact, so their house is the mosque. Right? They are called Ahlu Sufa. Right? The people of the bench. They sit on the bench, and you know whoever gives them food gives them food. If there's no one giving them food, they have no food. Right, so they're basically homeless. So Abu Huraira was one of them. Right, he was there. He was one of them. So he said one day he was so hungry, <laughs> and incredibly hungry. He said he was so hungry, and Sayyidina Abu Bakar walked past, right? Uh, and he kind of he stopped Sayyidina Abu Bakar and he said he asked the question, right? And he asked the question only because he wanted Sayyidina Abu Bakar to invite him to their house, to his house to eat. <laughs> He actually had no question to ask. But just, you know, he's too shy to say, feed me. <laughs> right? But he's like, maybe I'll get your attention. And maybe you will see how hungry I am and invite me to your house. Right? Maybe. So Sayyidina so, Abaka answered his question and he walked off. He said, ah, didn't work. <laughs> then Sayyidina so, Omar walked past and he stopped Sayyidina so, Omar and he asked the same question. <laughs> and, so, and he was hoping Sayyidina so, Omar would invite him to his house. Right? And Sayyidina so, Omar didn't see the, the hint. Right? He answered the question and he walked off. Right, and then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he came, and Zainal Abu Huraira got up and he stopped him to ask a question, and immediately the Prophet Muhammad could see what he wanted. He's basically hungry lah, right? So and even the Prophet Muhammad he doesn't know what he has at home, right? But he says to come to my house to see what we have at my house. So they went to his house, and they found that one of the neighbors had given the Prophet Muhammad a bowl of milk, right? There was a bowl of milk in the house, so he took the bowl of milk. Right, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he gave it to Abu Huraira, and he said, Abu Huraira, go to the mosque. Right, his instruction eh? go to the mosque and give all the ahlu sufa there, the homeless people there, give all of them, uh, let them drink the milk. And Abu Huraira, or in his heart, was like, what? <laughs> I asked for food, and then you made me go and like I have to now take the milk and give everybody else. <laughs> Right, but he, you know, of course, the adab la baik ya Rasulullah, you know, at your service, you oh, prophet of, of Allah. Right, so he took the milk and he went to the mosque. Right, and he said there are about seventy people here. Right, and I only have one bowl of milk. Right, how am I going to give everybody? And I also get some milk. Right, he was in his mind, he was thinking impossible. Right, so one by one, he began uh, giving the people milk to drink, and he was like, and they drank, and they drank, and they drank, and all of them drank from that one bowl. Right, so he was amazed. Right, that all of them drank to their fill. They actually drank to their fill, right, from that one bowl. And then he, and then by then the Prophet Muhammad had come to the mosque, and then he he was you know in, in, uh, amazed, and he brought the bowl to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that Abu Hurairah, you drink, and right, now you drink. So he said, no, Prophet, no, ya Rasulullah, you drink first, right, because it's out of uh, you know manners, right, adab. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "No, you drink first. Drink, right? So he took it and then he drank, and then he stopped, and then he said, "Drink some more, drink some more.'" Then he drank and he drank and then he stopped, 
And then the papa mama said, drink some more, drink some more. And then he drank and he drank and he drank. And he drank and he stopped and he said, yeah, Rasulullah, I cannot. I'm full. I'm like bursting already. <laughs> right. And then the papa mama smiled. Right. And then he took the bowl and he finished the meal. He finished off the meal. Right. So, and then it's so, so many, so many stories. Did he drink from it at first? Mm. No. No. Oh, he just passed it. He just passed it. <laughs> yeah, there's so many stories, lah. So many stories. So in Aisha also got story. So so in Aisha said that when she when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away, right, she had a container like of like like flour, you know, or something. And there was like some food lah in this container. It was covered, and she said, you know, every day from the time he passed away, and she, you know, she's just by herself in her room, so she would just take some food from there and she would eat it, right? It's like like some sort of like wheat. And then she would eat. So she, she would eat it every day. And then she noticed that it's been quite some time and this I'm still eating from the same container. But she never looked in. Right? She never looked in. Right? She just, she just kept taking from it. Right? So she was like, this is strange. Like, it's like a few, like, almost like, like 40 days have passed and the container is not, not finishing. <laughs> right? So she looked in. <laughs> she opened it and she looked in and she said, it's very little. And she ate it and she finished it. <laughs> And the key is not to look. Don't look. Don't see what's going on in there. <laughs> but she looked. Like, and then she finished. It's a bit of stories, eh? Inshallah, as we get to this part of, of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, so, so now we mention a lot of... There are many, many, many stories. Right? So, the the children of Abu Talib, right, they saw, right, the miracle of this boy, right, in their food, right? Whenever he sat with them in the same uh, circle when they were eating, right, the food will not finish. Right? And he was not there, the food would finish right and they also knew right that he that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the most beloved right to their father abu talib and they had no jealousy or whatsoever with this right? they, they, they actually completely understood and they themselves had had a lot of love right for the young prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was eight years old right so as he grew up right and now we're going to go right to the second point whereby he is now 12 years old Right, so he grew up in Mecca right, as a young boy, um, well loved by the people around him, right? Uh, and then now he's twelve years old. At twelve years old, his uncle decides to take the caravan and go to Syria, right? So we mentioned that the people of Mecca, the Quraysh, right, they had two trips every year, one trip right in the summer to Syria, right, and one trip in the winter to Yemen, right? And from these two parts, they will have their trade. So Syria connects them to uh, China. Right? Syria is up there. It's connect, it connects them to the Silk Route. Right? So they're connected to China. They're connected to Turkey and you know, further up west, right? to Rome, right? to Rome, to the, to the Europeans. Yemen connects them to India right? and to Africa. Right? So there's a connection there. Right? So Mecca is right in the center between these two worlds. Right? So Mecca was, in fact, a very busy trade uh, center. Right, whereby the, the goods from Syria that comes from China and, and Turkey and whatsoever, it will come to Mecca. Right? So they did have, they did have silk right? because they got the silk from the, 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 the silk route that was above. Right? And they did have uh, spices which they got from uh, Yemen, which got from, the, from India. It did come in. Right? So, so they will have this uh, trip you know, uh, twice a year. Right, every every year, and the, and everyone in Mecca was somehow or other involved in trade. Everyone, because Mecca was a trade center. Right, so either you are yourself a business person, yeah, you are your own boss, like the like the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Sayyidina Khadija. She was a boss of her entire of her own uh, company, right, basically of her own trading company, and they said that her company was so big, and she was a woman, eh, was so big that an entire caravan, right. Almost ninety nine percent of the camels were hers, carrying goods, right? So to when they had raising the caravans up to 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 uh, Syria, they said that all the other traders in Mecca put together their their their, their camels would not match up to her camels, right? and the amount of goods that she was carrying to uh, from Syria down to Mecca. So she was very very successful businesswoman, right? And so she was one of those. And so either they are they are bosses themselves or they are workers. Right. And Rasulullah Sallam, the Prophet Muhammad, he was one of the workers of Sayyidina Khadija. He, he worked for her right, in bringing the goods up to Syria. So what happened was when he was 12 years old, right, he went with his uncle, Abu Talib, right, to go up to Syria for trade. 
initially Abu Talib was not keen at all in bringing him up to Syria. Because Abu Talib knows about the stories in the past, right, whereby the Jews and the Christians who saw the Prophet Muhammad in the Arabian Peninsula, right, there were those who were there, and they saw the signs of, prophet, of, of prophethood in him, they tried to kill him. Right, because they saw you know, that this was the last prophet. Right? So he was not keen in going up to Syria because Syria was where the, uh, the, the, the Jews and the Christians were right, in Syria. Right? There, there were many of them there. Right? But the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, at this age, at 12 years old, he begged his uncle to bring him. He begged him. He right? said, so bring me, don't leave me behind. Don't leave me behind. Right? Who will you entrust me to? Right? So he begged his uncle over and over and over again to bring him. So eventually the uncle brought him. Right, but the uncle was still very wary, right, because he had, you know, he had to look up, he had to guard over the life of this young boy. So while they were traveling, right, up uh, to Syria, right, while they were traveling up to Syria, they passed by. Like uh, you would say, you you won't say like a monastery or anything, but it's more. It was a building. Right, it was a building. When I was in Syria, I visited this building. Right, it was like a, it was it was an empty building. Right, it was the uh, it was the house of someone. Right, that's what you would say. Right, it was the abode or the house of someone. In fact, it was a place of worship. Right, there was actually a person right named by the name of Bahira. Right, so Bahira, right, he was uh, a, you would say he was like a Christian or a Jew. Right, meaning he was someone who believed right in the books right of the Torah and the Injil. Right, so he believed in the books that were sent down by Revelation. Right, he was someone who was very much educated in this, uh, in 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 the books from that were sent down to the prophets. Right, he was someone who worshipped the one true God. Ahlul Kitab. Yes, you will say he is of the Ahlul Kitab. Right. So this Bahira, right, he uh, would stay in his place of worship right all the time. Right, he would just be worshipping Allah, worshipping Allah, worshipping Allah. He read through his books. Right? So he's something very, very learned man. He's a very learned man. And he knows in the books, right, it, it, there is a description right, of the coming prophet, the last prophet. So he read through and he saw you know, all the signs. Did they memorize? They know the signs, they know the coming of the last prophet, they know everything. It's all in the book, it was spelled out. Right, so and Habib he says that they, they even know you know how his eyebrows were gonna be like, how his hair was going to be like. He said that he was the most described person in their books. Most described. Like it was exact to the description. So and they knew from the books that this was the year that he would be making his his journey up into Syria. Even that was in the books. Right? It was everything was in their books. So they were all actually anticipating him coming through this route, right? Coming going up to Syria. So even the, the, the Jews of of Syria, they were they were actually positioned along the, the route, right, trying to spot the last prophet, right, to walk past. So he was also waiting, right, because he knew that this was the year whereby he would pass by. Every year when the Arabs passed by his his uh place of worship, he wouldn't care less. Right? He wouldn't look at them, he would just like ignore them. Right? But, but this year he was very interested. <laughs> right? He was looking out for the final prophets, Allah Alaihi so, from a distance, from his, and it was like, he could, he, could, he could see, he would climb up and he could see. From a distance, he saw the Arab caravan come. Right? And he saw that above this Arab caravan, there was a cloud that was following them. Right? One small cloud, it was following the caravan. So, that was the first sign that he saw. The first sign was the cloud. Yeah. All of these things, they know. <laughs> it's all mentioned. It's all mentioned. Right? So he saw the cloud. And he knows that clouds do not follow just any human being. Right? You know, any human being today who has a cloud following him around? <laughs> right? No. Right? You can't. You can make the cloud follow you. <laughs> right? You can't control the wind. You can't like you know. Like why is the cloud following you? <laughs> right? So so it's something that is unique to prophets. Right? So he saw the cloud. Right, that was the first clear sign that the prophet is within that caravan. Right, that group of uh, a caravan basically is a, a group of a lot of camels, right, and all their goods on the camels and people bringing the camels up into uh, Syria or down into Yemen. That's called a caravan, and the caravan usually will have like a, a, a few hundred camels in there. It's large, eh? Like, it's huge, right? So he will see one cloud following, and then he was watching this cloud, right, and seeing where the cloud was going. So he saw that the, the cloud moved towards a tree, right? So the cloud, you know, in sense, was fo- it seemed to be following someone. 
in the caravan, like shading, shading someone in the caravan. And the cloud followed and went to a tree. Right? And then he saw the cloud disappear and the tree's branches came in like that. Right? The branches began to come in to shade whoever was seated under the tree. So immediately, he actually went down from his uh, room. He went down and he went out. And he has never come out. And he stays in his room the entire time. Right, but he came out. He came out and he walked in between the people to the tree to see who was underneath that tree. Right, so he walked in between the people and he found a young boy. Right, and that was the Prophet Muhammad. He was 12 years old. Right, he found a young boy and he came near him Right? And he began and he kissed the boy on his forehead and on his feet. Right? Because he knew, he actually already knew. Right? The signs were very clear. Right? Uh, that you have the, 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 the cloud and then the tree come, you know, trying to shade you. So this uh, the creation, right? they know about the prophet. They know who is the last prophet. And then he kissed him right? and he said that you are the, the final prophet. Right? You, are, you are the one who has been sent right? as a mercy to this world. Right, you are the one, you are the one. Right, and then the people around him was like, what's wrong with you? Like, what's, <laughs> what's going on? And why are you kissing this boy? And why are you, you know, like praising this boy? And then, and then he says that because he is the one. He is the one. And then they said that, what are you talking about? Like, what, what do you know? Right, to Bahira, what do you know? Then he said that, when I saw you coming, right, wherever you walked, I could see the trees and the and the rocks, right? They were making sujud, right, to to someone in your group. I could see them, right? and they don't give sujud except to someone who is a prophet. They don't, they don't they don't bow. They were all bowing. I could see them bowing, right, towards was someone who's in the group. And then he said to the people, "All of you come to my house. You are invited for a meal, right? So a banquet, a feast." He said, come to my house, I want to invite you for a feast. So they said, this is strange. Like, you have never, ever, ever given us even the time of day. <laughs> you know, you never cared about us going past your, your, your hermitage, any, the place whereby you worship. Right? Suddenly, out of nowhere, you want to invite us for a feast. Right? So he says, that, no, you know, your guests, you know, your travellers, like, come, come to my house, I'll prepare a feast for you. I want to honour you as my guest. So they said, okay. And then he said, let all of you come. All of you. Every single one in this caravan needs to come, should come to my house for the feast. Right? I want every single one of you to come. So they said, okay, fine. Right? So he went to his house and he got the feast prepared. Right? And then they came. So when they came, right, he was looking around to see the Prophet wasallam again. So when he was looking around, he could not find anyone who was in the gathering right, who had the characteristics that he knew. Right? He had memorized the characteristics of the Prophet in the, from the books. So he looked around and he said, Do you, is everyone here? Is every single one of you here? I said, the, the young, the old, everyone. Everyone needs to be here. Right? And they said, that, yes, of course, everyone of worth is here. Right, but we left behind a young boy to look after our, our camels. Right, but he's a young boy. You don't want to know about him. Right, and then he said, no, no, no. Don't do that. Right, he said, he said I, I asked that every single one come. Bring the boy. Bring the boy. Right, so they went out. Right, they felt, uh, no, they felt, you know, <laughs> they felt uh, embarrassed that they did that. Right, they went out and they called him. And it was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, so they called him in. and said that uh, you know you are also invited for the feast. Right, so you know, and he, when he came in, he saw that you know it was the you know if you ever been to Arab countries and their houses, right? They always have a central courtyard that has no roof. Right, they always have that. Right, so the house, the, the rooms are by the side, and they have a central area that is uh, you know roofless. Uh, open air. They had an open air concept. <laughs> and I used to live uh, in those kind of houses when I was in like, Syria. Right? And it's, it's like, it's, it's nice until it snows. So <laughs> then, when it snows, right, it's not very nice. <laughs> it's freezing cold. <laughs> right? But they have that concept. Lah. Right? They have that concept. In, in, even in, in, in Yemen, like, they have that concept of, it's called the house. Right? It's called the open air area. Right, so so uh, from when I was there, it, it hailed. Right, <laughs> there was hail, so the, the whole thing was covered in ice. <laughs>
<laughs> so so anyway, uh, they were seated there. That was where the feast was laid, right? And so it was under their son. So when he came in, he saw that you know uh, the the elders right who were in the group they had taken the shaded spots, right? So of course he had to sit in a sunny spot, right? So when he sat, right, the tree that was nearest to him right began to lean. <laughs> <laughs> to try and shade him. <laughs> and Bahira could see so clearly that she was trying to shade him. <laughs> trying to lean in to, to shade him. So he so, so, so Bahira, you know, of course he knows it's the signs are so clear. Because the, he, he he was described right exactly as how he was in the books. It was exact. So he came and he sat next to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he observed every movement of this boy. And he's twelve years old. Eh? So he was so Bahira, and, and the people were just like, oh, so, uh, you know, amazed by what's going on. Like, what's wrong with this man who never cared to even look at our caravan? Now all of a sudden, he just like all oh, so interested in this one young boy. Like, just, like what's what's up with him, right? So so, but Bahira was like, he was just observing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, observing, 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 the entire time. He was just so amazed as to how exactly he was like the one who was described in the books, right, of Nabi Musa, of Nabi Isa alaihi wasallam. So then he wanted to test the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to test to see, to really confirm, is this really the last Prophet? Because they've been waiting. They read in their books that his time is now. They know that he has been born. They saw his star come up. Right? They know he's around. But they were just they were waiting for him, waiting for him to manifest. Right? So he, he, he turned to the Prophet Muhammad and he said, I ask you, by the right of Lat and Uzza, right, that you answer some of my questions. Right? And, and what he just said was that Lat and Uzza are two idols that the Arabs at that time, they used to, uh, aggrandize. They used to glorify these two idols, right? They were idols. And he knew, that, and he's not a believer in Latin Uzzah, right? He's a believer in the one true God, right? But he knew that the Arabs aggrandize these two idols. So he was testing the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam first. So he said, you know, I ask you by the right, right, or by the truth of Lat and Uzzah, right, that you answer my questions. And then he, the Prophet Muhammad at that age, 12 years old, he turned to him and he said, don't ask me by them. For surely they are the most hated things to me. Right? I hate them. Right? So, uh, so that he know, that's the first sign. Right? That the prophet cannot be an idol worshipper. He's not an idol worshipper. And then he said, Then I ask you by Allah that you answer my questions. And then he said, Ask. Ask your questions. Right? And he began to ask him questions about his food, about his, you know, his 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 life. Many, 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 many questions. Right? They are not recorded. Right? But they were, you know, they they, they said that he asked him many, many questions, and he answered his questions to the point whereby he answered everything exactly as how it was in the book, right? That he had. Right? And not many people had know know of this these things. And then finally he said, "May I look, you know, at your back? Right? May I look between your shoulder blades?" Right, then he said, okay. Right, so he, he pushed down his, his shirt. Right, he, they, were, they, they were cloaks right, back then. So he just pushed it down. Right, and he saw the seal of prophethood. Right, the Prophet Muhammad has a seal of prophethood. We'll go into what this seal is. Right, how does it look like? Right, so, but he has a seal of prophethood between his shoulder blades. So when he saw it, right, Bahira saw it, he was like, this is the last prophet, it's him. Right, it's him, it's him. Right, it's, there's no doubt that it is him. And then he asked around, who is in charge of this boy? He asked right, among the people there. And Abu Talib who was there, he said, I am in charge of him. I am his wali, me his guardian, I am his guardian. And then he turned to Abu Talib and he said, who are you with respect to him? Means how are you related to him? And Abu Talib said, I am his father. Right, because you know, in, in the Arab culture, right, the father's brother is like the father. And the mother's sister is like the mother. Right? So you're not lying, right? but that is how it is. Right? You, can, you can call your brother's son, if you're, if you're a man, you can call your brother's son, your son. That's my son. Right? Like I can call my sister's children, my children. Right? Because I'm her sister. Right? So mother's sister is like the mother, father's brother is like the father. Right? So, so he said, I am, he's my son. Right? And Bahira was like, no, 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 no. Right, impossible, impossible. His father cannot be alive. And then Abu Talib said, "Yes, I am his uncle. Like right, his real father, 
right? And then, and then Bahira asks, so what happened to his father? Right? Where is his father? Right? And uh, Abu, uh, Abu Talib said, his father passed away when he was still in his mother's womb. Then Bahira said, you are right. You are right. That is a sign of the last prophet. His father will pass away before he was born. Right. So, so and then Bahira said to Abu Talib, bring him back to Mecca now. Don't bring him into Syria. Don't. Right. Because he said that because there are Jews in Syria, there are Jews in Syria that if they see what I, what I see, right, they would kill him. Right. So I want you to do, no, now go back as quickly as you can. Do not bring him out of Mecca. Leave him in, in Mecca because if the Jews see him, they will kill him. Right? And Abu Talib, you know, he got scared. <laughs> right? And he immediately, he took off with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They broke away from the caravan and they went back to Mecca. Right. So, it, uh, so that is the story of... Uh, yeah? One question. So, does the Prophet Muhammad know he's the Prophet at that point? Like, you know, why are you such a... He... The, the, the story is, right, is that people keep saying to him, Right, but it's like you know, like for example, someone says to you, "You're a wali, you're a wali, you're a wali." You know, for example, right? You're like, yeah, <laughs> right. You know, not like not yeah, right. But any, you don't know what to think about it, right? Like you wouldn't really give it much thought. So he, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had all these comments being given to him, right? But when the revelation came, he was in shock. Right. It wasn't that he was expecting the revolution to, the revolution to come, right? So, but he was he was in shock, in shock, right. and in fact he thought he was being possessed. Right. He thought that it was a it was a devil that was coming to to bother him, right? So you know he is, he he these things happen around him, right? But maybe you know it's, there was a, there was a there was a like there was it didn't occur until it actually occurred, right? It actually, it actually happened, right? The revolution actually happened to him. Right, but it just didn't sink in, lah. You would say, didn't right. uh, didn't sink in. It didn't sink in that he was truly the final prophet. Right. So he went back, right, to uh, to he went back to Mecca, right, with his uh, with Abu Talib, right, and he stayed there, right, and he grew up in Mecca. I will mention a bit, a few things about the youth of or the the, the youth of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So growing up in Mecca. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as a young as a young boy, right, there was one situation, right. Allah subhanahu wa taala always protected his prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he he never got involved with what the people of the town, right, were all about, right, were all involved in. Like for example, when he was fourteen years old, when he was fourteen years old. Right, the young boys of the of Mecca, right, they were all going to help with the with the um, fixing of the Kaaba. Right, they were fixing it. Right, so some part of the or some parts of the stones had fallen off. Right, it was you know breaking down. So they were fixing it. Right, so what they would do was that, and these are people who are poor. Right, so they usually only have one piece of cloth to cover their uh, privates. That's all. Right, they are actually very poor people. They don't have they don't have they don't have uh, proper clothing. Right, so they just have like like a sarong. Right, where they go around in the sarong, and that was in it was you know pre-Islamic Arabia. So the young boys, right, uh, in that situation, right, they had to carry the stones on their shoulders. Right, this would hurt their shoulders, right, because the stones would be rest or rest on their skin directly. So what they would do was that they would take off their their izar, their sarong, right, their, basically the cloth, right, and they would fold it and they would place it on their shoulder, right, and then they would carry the stone on the shoulder. So in doing that, of course, they are burying themselves, lah. <laughs> right? They are completely, you know, uh, naked, right? And carrying the stones to the Kaaba. But it was something so common, right? In those days, right? In in this is what was what fifth uh, century, right? Fifth century Saudi, uh, fifth century Arabia, right? So it was common to them. You know, it was very common because they were doing tawaf naked. They were people who were uncultured, right? they were uncultured people. Right, so for them, you know, to take off their izar is something that was, you know, everybody does it. Right, it's no problem. Right, and then they put it on their shoulder and they will carry the rock so that it won't hurt, it won't hurt their shoulder. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right, he also had, you know, an izar like other boys. Right, izar basically means uh, sarong. Right, I keep using the same word, izar, izar. But izar is the is the word that is, is the word that they use for that for that clothing. Right, basically, it's a it's a wrap cloth. Uh, that's what you would say. Right, it's a wrap cloth right around the waist. 
So he also was clothed that way. Right? He was clothed with a wrap cloth. Right? So he would carry the rock on his shoulder, on his skin. Right? So he would hurt himself and carry the rock. He wouldn't remove his wrap cloth. Right? So his uncle was watching him and watching all the other boys, you know, uh, using the cloth to, to cushion right, the, the, the stone. His uncle said, you know, why don't you just remove your wrap cloth and do as other boys did? Because you're, you're bleeding, right? you're, you're hurting yourself right, by putting the stone on your shoulder like that. Right? And he was, you know, he was, he was res- being trying to be respectful to his uncle, but he was a very shy person. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was very, he was very shy. Right, so he was not he was not keen on, on doing what the other boys are doing. <laughs> right. So he dropped he put the rock down, right, and he held his he held his uh, rep cloth. Right. So and then he heard a voice from the sky. Right. And this voice said, Muhammad, hold on to your rep cloth and don't take it off. Right. <laughs> so the the, the 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 voice, you know, told him, Don't take it off because he seemed to be like thinking about it. You know, because his uncle was saying, no, take it off, take it off. What's wrong with you? Everybody's doing it. Right? But he was like, you know, like thinking like, like, should I? Like, this is you know, not, not his character. Right? It's not his way. So, but he heard the voice, right, you know, from the sky saying, Muhammad, do not take off your wrap cloth. Right? And then, then he passed out. <laughs> he actually passed out. Right? Because of the, the, the voice from the sky, he's 14 years old. Right, so <laughs> he passed out, right? He passed out. And thereafter, his uncle never made him take off his Abbas, you know, Abbas. Uh, his uncle never made him take off his uh, red cloth, right? So he was known for his modesty and for his chastity, right? He never, he never uh, showed his aura to e- anyone. And even his wife said they never, ever, ever, or his uh, private parts, right? His wife said they never saw any of his uh, private regions ever between the, the the navel to the knee they never saw that region of his ever because mm. right? he was so shy <laughs> right that he never exposed it right so even to his own wives he didn't expose it right so it's like subhanallah he was uh, a very shy person right so it, uh so so there was like of, of the situations eh? and there was another situation whereby when he was in his teenage years right all his early 20s the youth, again the youth, right? the youth of, of Mecca at that time, and even the youth of our day to day, every youth, right, they have their parties, right, so they always have, every night they have their parties, they have their drinking, they have their women, right, and it's in every culture, every culture has this, right, so at that time, right, the youth of Mecca, right, and this is pre-Islam, this is before Islam, right, so they, they were used to having their, 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 their partying at night. With drinking, alcohol, music, and they have their own music lah. Right, their own music. Whatever lah. It's the same as it's today. Only different types of music and different types of alcohol and different types of women, right? But they have the same thing. Same thing going on back then. And that was 1,400 years ago. Same thing going on now. Right, same thing. Human beings are the same, right? So, uh, so his friends invited him to come to the party because he never comes. Right, so they said to him, you know, come, come, just come one time, you don't, you know, just, just sit with us. And at this point in his life, he has reached, you know, his late teens or his early twenties. He has never drunk uh, alcohol, ever. Right, so you know, and he was before Islam. Right, so Allah has protected him from from ever drinking alcohol. He's never bowed to the idols either. Right, so never, he's never, never taken part in whatever the youth were doing. Right, and he was, we know that pre-Islam Arabia, right. Alcoholism was very much widespread. Uh, stealing was my, was widespread. Plunder, you know, people plundering, people stealing, people, uh, you know, doing all kinds of, of uh, crimes. It was very, very, very widespread because it was an uncultured people. Right? They were very uncultured. So even fornication was very, very widespread. Right? Very, it was everywhere. Right? And killing their own babies, it was widespread. Right? So it was something that was, was everywhere and it was a norm to the people. Right, but he, growing up in the society, he never took part. He just never did. Right, he just, you know, he had his, he minded his, he minded his own business. Right, he was initially he worked as a shepherd. Right, so he would take the flock, you know, of the people of Mecca, and he would shepherd the flock for them. And he would go into that story a bit about him uh, shepherding, shepherding sheep, right, shepherding sheep, about him. I don't know sure what's the correct word of it. <laughs> like, you're a ganam, man. Herding, herding. 
shepherding eh. <laughs> I don't know I don't know all this terminology when it comes to sheep eh. <laughs> Is there such a verb? I shepherded the sheep. <laughs> Never mind, it's okay, it's okay. We'll figure it out. Alright. <laughs> you can't talk about the ring. <laughs> okay, anyway. So he, 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 he used to work as a shepherd, right, from before, right, because he knows that his uncle, Abu Muntalib, is very poor and has many children and he always throughout his life and you will see it even in the prophethood he always felt indebted towards his uncle and right, for looking after him from the time he was eight years old it's an orphan till the time he grew up and he got married right so he always felt indebted towards his uncle right and he always tried to help uh to help lighten the financial burden right, on his uncle right so from a very young age he began to shepherd Right, so he will go out, he will take the sheep of the people of Mecca and he'll bring it into the pastures and he'll get some money for it. Right, so it was a job lah, that he used to do. Right, to help his uncle, you know, lessen his burden, his financial burden because he has so many children. Right, so so one day his his friends right, told him, you know what, you're always working because he's always you know, with the sheep. And when they go to party, they will, they will leave all their sheep with him. Right, because all the, the youth, that's how they earn money. Right, they go and shepherd sheep. Right, so they would just like like dump all their sheep with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he would just look after all the sheep lah, look after all the sheep, and then they go and party, right? And then when they're done, they come back <laughs> next morning, and they come back drunk and whatever, and then they take the sheep back, right? So like so, so he never goes, he just never goes. So one day they said, you come, 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 and they tried to convince him, just come, just come and see the party, you know, it's just it's gonna everyone's gonna be there whatsoever. So he said, okay, right, maybe I'll go and see. So they said at this time, right, that's where the party is going to be. So the time came, right, and he didn't, they didn't find that he was there. He didn't come to the party. So the next morning they came to him and they said to him, we didn't see you at the party, where were you? Then he was like, oh, you know what? I fell asleep. So <laughs> I just didn't come. Right? I was sitting there with the sheep and I fell asleep. And I just woke up in the morning. So I slept right through the party. Right? And then they said, okay, come the next day. Right, there's another party going on, come the next day. The next day, same thing happened. They didn't find him there. And the next day, they came, they came to him and they were like, you know, why didn't you come to the party? And he said, I fell asleep again. You know, I just, I just fell asleep. I just, I don't know, sleep came over me and I just fell asleep. Right, and then they tried, they asked him a third time. And the same thing happened the third time round. Right, eventually, they gave up asking him. Because right, whenever they asked him to come to the party, he would just sleep through the party somewhere else. He would be in, in wherever he is at with his sheep and he'll fall asleep. So he won't even remember to even come. Right? And that was how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from going to these places. He was not allowed to go. Right? To, you know, he, was, he was pure. Right? He was kept pure. Right. One thing about the shepherding of sheep eh? <laughs> right, uh, is that uh, there was a, there's a hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to his companions, and this was later on in his life, when he was in his 50s, right? Or, you know, uh, later on in his life. He said to his companions, there was not a prophet, right? not a single prophet, except that he used to rear sheep. That's the word, rear. I right? said that he used to rear sheep. And then they said, and even you, ya Rasulullah, even you are prophet of Allah? And he said, yes, even me. I used to rear sheep. Right, and I used to, you know, shepherd them for the people of Mecca for a few, you know, for for a few coins. Right, they would pay me for doing it. Right, and the and the scholars they say, what is the wisdom, right, behind him saying that that every single prophet, every prophet, every prophet from Nabi Musa, Nabi Isa, Nabi Ibrahim, every single prophet, shepherd sheep. <laughs> they had a point in their life whereby that was what they worked as. And prophets, they work, eh? You don't think that they're prophets, they get free money from somewhere. <laughs> right? They work. It was said that Nabi Dawood was a carpenter. And he used to, to, to do carpentry. <laughs> right? So they, used, they, they worked. Right? They, had, they had work whereby they would have their worldly, uh, their worldly gain, right? from which they can uh, you know, buy food or whatsoever. Right? So every prophet had their own job that they used to do, but it was small, lah, small jobs by the side. So he said, that I used to. So the, the, what is the wisdom behind every prophet having to shepherd sheep? 
Right, so the the main wisdom right behind this is because when they are younger, before they reach revelation and before they were sent revelation from from God Subhanahu Wa Taala Himself, right, they were trained right with sheep. So if you can train yourself right to be patient, right with sheep, because sheep you cannot be fierce with them; they run away. Right, so you can't like come back lah, like you know, like you can you can shout at them and tell all of them to come back. You know, it's already it's already Maghrib. <laughs> Right, you let them. You bring them to the pastures. Right, they go out and they eat wherever they want to eat. They go wherever they want to go. Right, and then you have to herd them back. You have to actually go around and coax them to come back. Right, otherwise they will just you know not really care about you. Right, so so shepherding sheep requires a lot of patience, a lot of patience, right, and a lot of gentleness. You need to be able to uh, keep your cool. When they come to sheep, otherwise they run away from you, <laughs> right? So you know, so 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 these are the 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 uh, what is it? A moment. These are the wisdoms right, as to why every prophet was made to shepherd sheep because later on in life they will be they will have to shepherd human beings. They will have to bring human beings together right, and to cause their hearts to bind and to be united right, and not be apart. Right? So they have to have the skill. Right, of being patient, they have to have the skill of being gentle, right, with people. Because if you, if people and Allah says this in the Quran about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if you were harsh at them, right, against them, or if you scolded them, they would have run away from you, right? They would have run away from you far away. But you are gentle and you are kind to them, right? And you don't scold them, right? Then they come to you. And that is the secret, you know. If if you really want people to to listen to you, and right, you cannot raise your voice, and right, you cannot be harsh to them, right, then they will run away. Right, but you need to speak to them gently, but you know repeatedly, right, to them. So, it, uh, so these are all the all the things lah that, that in his in his youth, right, that he would encounter, right, but he would not take part in, right. And another, one more is one more story before we go on to the next part, right. Uh, so he also the people of Mecca at that time they had adulterated the rites of Hajj and the rituals of Hajj the rites of Hajj they had adulterated it. So Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam Nabi Ibrahim right when he first did the rites of Hajj right so Hajj begins at Arafah right so you the, the wajib Hajj right you actually go to Arafah right you spend half the day there at Arafah. And then you come to uh, Muzdalifa, you pick up the stones, right? You spend a night at Muzdalifa, and then you go to Mina. That's when you throw the stones at the largest uh, jamra, the largest pillar. That's the rites of Hajj, and that has been there since the Prophet Ibrahim, right? Since his time. So the people of Mecca, and, and Arafah is far, it's not near, right? It's quite far. You take a bus there, or you can walk, you know, if you're up for it, right? So, so the people of Mecca at that time. They say that you know what we are the Quraysh, we are the Homs. Right? They call themselves Homs. We are the Quraysh, we are the Homs. We are the elites of the Arabs, right? And they call themselves elite of the Arabs because of the incident with the elephant when the elephant came to destroy the Kaaba and Allah sent birds to destroy the elephant. So they began to use that that uh, event, right, to you know aggrandize themselves, right? About, you know, but of course before that they already began aggrandizing themselves, right? So they say that we are the elites of the Arabs. Right, we don't have to go all the way to Arafah, right? So they they make up their own rules, lah. They change the rules. They make up their own rules. We just go to Mina, right? We stay at Mina, and then the other people, right, the lower Arabs, they go to Arafah because they are lower than us, right? And they won't even wear the they won't wear, wear the ihram also, right? They wear the normal clothes because they say we are the elite of the Arabs, so we wear normal clothes. We don't wear. We won't wear like the rest of the Arabs wear, right? So they, you know, they make up all these things. But the but the people they will say that they would notice the young Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam whenever he did Hajj and he did Hajj before Islam, he did do Hajj, right? But he would follow the way of Nabi Ibrahim. The way of Nabi Ibrahim was still preserved, right? In his time, there were people in Mecca who were on the way of Nabi Ibrahim, right? They were very much uh, existent, right? So he. They would say that he, and he is of the highest clan, right in the in the Quraysh. He was of the highest, highest clan. Right, they would see him right, wearing the ihram 
as a young man, like right, in his in his twenties, you know, or as a teenager in his twenties, he as a young man he would go all the way to the to Arafah and be amongst the so called lower Arabs, right? and everybody will see and they will know and they all know that he's from the from the higher from from the higher class, right? and they will all wonder like why is he here when everybody else of his clan they don't come here, right? but they stay in Mina, right? but he says that this is the way of my of my of our prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and we don't change his way. And this is what we were taught. So these are the examples, right, uh, as to his uh, youth and his and his growing up in Mecca. So now we reach, we reach the time whereby he begins. Some is going more than what we wrote. Eh, we're going to reach the time whereby he begins to work for Sadina Khadija. I'm going to speak a bit about Sadina Khadija before we go into her. Employing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Sayyidina Khadija, right, who is she? Eh? Right, why is she so special? Right, Sayyidina Khadija, she's one of those women that really, like, if I was to meet any woman in this world, I can meet. <laughs> she would be like one of the ones, you know, I really, really want to meet her right, and talk to her <laughs> because she is someone, you know, like she is someone strong of character, of you know, of of esteem. You know, she was somebody who was very confident right, of herself. So, say, let's, let's speak about her, 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 her life story. So, Zaina Khadija, she was born 15 years before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, in fact, she was 15 years old right, when he was born. Right? So, she was born 15 years prior to him. She's 15 years his senior. Lah, right? She was married twice before him. With each marriage, her husband died. So she's twice widowed, right? She married at a very young age. Right? This, this people, uh, the, the culture is that they marry young, right? So probably her first marriage happened when she was, uh, maybe around, right, ten, around there, eleven, right? They marry young, they marry young, right? So she was widowed at a very young age. She had three children from the first two marriages, right? One child from one from one marriage and two more children from a second marriage, right? So she. She she has three children, right? She was twice widowed, right? Uh, and now she is she, she and she has many people proposing to her, because she is really really very desired. desired. Right? After her second uh, husband passed away, she occupied herself, right? She refused to get married again, right? She refused any proposals, right? Uh, and she occupied herself. Right? That's what that's what she does. You know, a woman. Right, you don't have to have a man, right? So she just she rejected all proposals, right? She wasn't in this in marriage anymore. She has three children, right? And she began to occupy herself with two things. Right? That's why I want to meet her. <laughs> if I can meet her, lah. I want to meet her and talk to her, right? So you know, like this interview her, right? About how she lives her life. So she she occupied herself with two things. While the woman at that time, right, they were very very much occupied with again parties and you know beautification. And you know vanity and whatsoever, she was not interested at all in any of these things. She had no interest whatsoever, and she was very beautiful herself. And she was a very beautiful young lady who was widowed twice. She had a nephew, right, who was very much into trade. Right, he had links in Syria, and he had links in Yemen. Right, she had wealth from her father. Her father had passed away. She had wealth, right? That was left behind for her, and it was from her father. So she became, she began at a young age. She began to be interested in business, right? But she had, she had very high integrity and very high honesty, and right? she refused to allow her money to be uh, squandered or to be used, right, in anything that was even slightly dishonest, right? or in any business that was not halal, that was not permissible. Right, so she kept her business to be completely permissible, completely halal, right? So she used her nephew, right, to get employees under her, right, to do trade for her. So that's how she began her business. And because of her policies, you know, of of uh, honesty, of integrity, of uh, transparency, right, and of getting very good quality things, like her business, Allah allowed her business to flourish and bloom. So she became the most wealthy woman in the entire of Mecca at a very young age. The most wealthy right, woman in the whole of Mecca. So that was one thing she occupied herself with, business. And the other thing she occupied herself with right, was studying. 
she had a cousin named Waraka bin Naufal. And this cousin of hers, he was very, very interested in the books and the people of the book. So he had a Torah with him, he had Injil, he had other scriptures that he had gathered right, in his study. And throughout his life, since, since he was a young, young man, he always only held on the religion of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, and he was very, very interested in learning the books. So he started, he spent years of his life studying these books. He was the cousin of Sayyidina Khadija. So she, right, now she's widowed, right, three children, business, she would spend a lot of her time also going to him and studying with him. She would study. Right. So, you know, they said, I want to meet her, right? Involved in business, involved in studies. Right? What more, you know, of a woman is that? <laughs> right. So, she's very, she's very practical. Right. Very, very much, very, very practical. Right. This is what we occupy ourselves, our time with. Right. Something that is beneficial. Right? And in fact, the, her business, it was not for her. Because when the money came in, she would just feed the poor. Right? All of the profit went to the poor. That was it. So, she did this business because she has time and she has money. Right. She's a widow. Right, so she, what, what to do with her, with her money and her time? Go do business. Money comes in. I don't need the money. Give to the poor. That's it. And that's what she used to do. She used to give a lot of money to the poor and feed them. Right, and then she would go and sit with her cousin and learn the books. So she was also a monotheist right, from a very young age. Right? She never uh, worshipped the idols. She worshipped the one true God of the Prophet Ibrahim salam, And she was a student of her cousin Waraka. She was a student, eh? Right? She also learned from Waraka about the coming of a prophet. She learned about it. Right? She knew that it was going to happen. Right? And she learned the signs from Waraka also in these books. So they were actually all, you know, looking out to see where, you know, like who is this last prophet that is going to come. So you see, she is someone who is not, she's not like, like, Someone who accidentally stumbled upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It wasn't an accident. An accident, eh? And she was somebody who was who was in the know, because she knew very much about this situation. So after many, many, many years, right, of studying with her, and we mentioned the story before, right, of her sitting around the Kaaba and a Jew came in, and this was at the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Like a Jew came into the Kaaba and and he he shouted out to the woman there, saying that, "Oh, woman of 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 Mecca." Right, the the last prophet has been born last night. Right, if any of you could be a bit for him, be a bit for him. Right, meaning be a wife for him. Right, and then he, and then the, the woman there, they, they threw stones at him to chase him away, <laughs> right, because his his speech was so you know unrefined. Right, so but Sayyidina Khadija, she was sitting there and she made an intention in her heart that she will find this prophet and she will marry him. Right, so she was she was intense, you know, and she was so you can see her character. Eh? She's very strong. Very strong will. So many proposals came her way from the rich and from the powerful people of Mecca. The most powerful, the most rich, sent their proposals her way. All of them she rejected. All. All of them she rejected. She had no interest in marrying just anybody. Right? She, so subhanAllah, like, like she can, you can imagine the kind of strength of a woman that she was. She was her own boss. The people who worked under her were all men. Right? So the men worked for her and she was the boss. Right, all the money went to the poor, right? And she was spending her time studying. Right? I mean, what kind of like, what kind of like exemplary? And she had three kids at that time with her. She was a she was a single mother, right? Both husbands passed away, right? And both kid, all three kids became Muslim, eventually. Yeah, right. So Subhanallah, like you see this 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 woman, you know how she was. So she heard about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. By this time. Right, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was twenty five years old, right, and he had already gained the rapport right, of being a sodiqul amin, right, meaning the most trustworthy and the most honest, right, because the people have never heard him to lie at all in his life, since he was a child, right, he never ever 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 lied, ever, right, and we know you know the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam his truthfulness. Right, to the point whereby, you know, when his, when his wife Sayyidina Aisha asked him, right, and she asked him, who is the most beloved wife to you? Right, and you know, if, if a person were to ask, uh, a woman were to ask her husband that, right, and of course he had, he had several wives, right, it is permissible for the husband to say, you, 
Right, it's permissible. She can say that, right? Because to keep the peace, <laughs> right? In 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 the marriage, you are the most beloved wife to me, right? But the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he was asked, when she asked him that, who is the most beloved wife to you? Right, his answer was Sayyidina Khadija, and she has passed away years ago. <laughs> and this was the time when she has already passed away. Eh? So he answered Khadija. Right, and Sayyidina Aisha became very jealous. You know, like why, why her? She's dead. <laughs> Like, why do you still love her? Right. Uh, uh, and and the, ula- and the, the scholars, they say that this, this incident shows us that he is incapable of lying. He's incapable. Even though it would make more sense, right, to, uh, to any other man to just say to the woman, you, you are the most beloved. <laughs> right. Just say to make her happy. Right. But he couldn't. He couldn't. He can't lie. Because the most beloved is who? It was her. Sayyidina Khadija. And as you go into her life with him, uh, you will see how how so precious and so beloved she was to him, even though she was 15 years his senior. So we need to write like a book or a poem eh, on their love story. So it's so it's so amazing uh, when I go through their love story and, and, and how he would remember her to the end of his life. Uh, and she passed away, he he lived for a good thirteen years almost or twelve years. After she passed away, right, and he never forgot her, never, right. In fact, you know, he would he would be moved when he saw her things in front of him, and he would always send gifts to her friends, right? and he would. And there was once her sister came in, and her sister, you know, uh, gave salams at the door, and his face changed color, and he was like Khadija, you know, like in a way, like like in a way, because her sister sounded like her. Her sister had the same voice <laughs> as her. So when she gave salam, like his face changed color in the sense it brought back memories. Because like, it was exactly hard as how she spoke. That was how she was. This is after her death. Like, after she had passed away. Like, so, you know, it's very the, the story is very sad, inshallah. But it's very beautiful. You know, like he he the the, the true love right between him and her. So anyway, the beginning of the love story, eh? right? So this is how they met. <laughs> how they met. <laughs> So she was looking, she was already looking for the last prophet. She was really, you know, actively looking for the last prophet to marry. Right. So she heard about this Sadiqul Amin, right, this trustworthy and honest man named Muhammad. And she sent her slave boy right, to go and see who this man is. Right. And then so his, her slave boy was Maisara. Right, my Sarah is a boy's name, right? It's not a girl's name, right? So my yeah, it's a boy's name. <laughs> so sometimes people read the story and they say my Sarah went on a trip with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they think a woman went on a trip with a man. No, my Sarah is a boy. <laughs> he's a he's a boy. It's not a girl's name. <laughs> our our community has got it wrong. We think it's a girl's name. It's not a girl's name, <laughs> right? So my Sarah. Uh, he so he went to find the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And he found him to be a righteous man, upright man, and he uh, told Sayyidina Khadija about him, and Sayyidina Khadija said, "Tell him that I want to employ him, right? To to bring my trade up to Syria and you know just to, to sell my stuff right in Syria." So he was told about this business opportunity, right? Because at this point he's twenty five, he himself was looking for marriage. Right, so he's looking for marriage, but he's very poor. So he has nothing to offer the family of the bride. Right? Because for them, you know, you pay the dowry towards the family of the, towards the bride. And right? she gets a dowry from you. So he was very, very poor, right? Because he's been shepherding all his life. So how much can you earn, right, from shepherding all these sheep? Right? So he was looking into doing business right, at twenty five years old. So when this opportunity came, right, to him. Right, that, that you know that, that this this rich woman of Mecca and she's forty years old, right? And she wants to hire honest people to work for her. She, and she was very particular in her business, never to hire anyone, right, who was dishonest. She was very particular about it, right? So she would always send her slave boys, right, to to follow them, right, and to see what they do in their business. See if they take money, if they jack up the price, if they do, if they, they sell uh sport goods, right? She would always check, right, about. For, over all her employees, so he was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was offered the job, right? Bring the the goods to Syria and sell. Before they left, she said to Maisara, right? I want you to watch this man Muhammad closely, 
Like watch him closely and after the trip, come back to me and report every single thing you see about this man. Everything I want to hear. I want a full report about this man, Muhammad. No, this, is, this is business, right? This is business. We are bringing Sira into real life. <laughs> it's real life, right? So she told him, I want a full report about this man. So my Sarah said, okay, I will, I will watch him. I will follow him everywhere he goes. So they left on the trip, right? And the first thing my Sarah observes is that there's a cloud following them everywhere they go. <laughs> the cloud's still there, right? So he, this is the first thing he noticed. That there's a cloud that goes everywhere he goes. <laughs> Right, so it's so the first thing, you know, mental note, like cloud. Okay. And then they, they go on their trip, right, and then he notices that whatever tree that uh, the Prophet Muhammad said underneath, the branches would turn in, right, to shade him even more. So second thing that was peculiar, right, that he also took note. Okay, that's strange, right, that's how he was. And then he noticed that this man... Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he never cursed, nor did he swear, nor was not he ever hear anything negative from this person, which is something that is difficult on a travel. Right, whenever you travel with anyone, right, no matter who it is, even your own husband, right, you will hear, maybe not by vulgarities, but you will hear complaints. At least they're complaints, right? Complain, complain, complain. <laughs> Right, so, and you would, you would. Every human being, when you travel, right, there's discomfort, right, there's unhappiness, there's because you're traveling, right, and they're on camel, eh? They're not on like on train or what. They're on camel, right. So people always complain, right. If you try to go on camel, right, for for a few months to Syria, it takes it takes about you know, uh, I think about a few months journey to reach Syria. Right, yeah, she takes a long time to actually reach Syria. So the whole time you're just visiting with this man <laughs> the entire time. Right? And he said he's never heard him utter even a word of negativity. No complaints, nothing. Right? It was not, you know, he was he was thinking, this is not normal. <laughs> Most people would do it. Right? But this is exceptional. Right, there's something special about this person. He's not complaining and nothing from his mouth. And he was the most kind to my Sarah as a slave boy. He's a slave boy, and my Sarah knows whenever he goes on off trips with all these employees of, of his of his uh of his owners in the Khadija, the employees would abuse him, right, in, in work. I right, make him do everything. Right, because he's a slave boy, you know, and we are just the employee and we are being paid. Right, so you know, so, so they would actually make use of the slave that is there, and even for us also, you know, even we don't even we don't even own slaves, but if someone's like helper came to your house for hari raya to help wash the dishes, like you are like do this, do that, do this, do that, you abuse them, right? In a way, you make them do everything, correct, and you won't do anything because you are paying them, right? <laughs> like why would you pay? Why would why would why would you you know do anything, right? But my Sarah noticed this. That he was not someone like that. He would never order order my Sarah around. He would do things himself. And he had such a humility about him. So he was like this, the character of this man is exceptional. There's something about this man and he was always smiling. So, you know, always cheerful, always joyous every day. So, he, so, so my Sarah was, subhanAllah, he was so amazed. Right, by this man, that he, and my Sarah, he, in fact, he relates. I began to fall in love with this man. I was so taken in by him. I, I, so I, I, I follow him everywhere he went because I really liked he, who he was. He was a very lovable person. Very likable person. And then he relates, right? And this is the, his report, eh? So in the Khadija. He relates, right, a few incidences that happened along the way. So the first incident that happened, right, was that he, the Prophet Muhammad went to a tree and sat down underneath a tree. My Sarah was watching from far. Then a man came up from behind, right? and this man happened to be someone of the people of the book, and like a Jew or a Christian, right? who knows the, the scriptures. And the man came and asked my Sarah, who is that man under the tree? Right? And my Sarah said, oh, it's a man from Koresh, right? from Makkah. And then the man said, no one sits under that tree except a prophet. Right? No one sits under that tree except a prophet. And the man walked away. So my Sarah was like, his hair stood. <laughs> like, he was like, what did the man just say? Like, no one sits under that tree except a prophet. Right? And then they went on in their journey. Right? And again, it happened. 
by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was resting, right? And someone came up from behind my Sarah and said that, "Can I meet your companion?" Meaning the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They've been they've been observing lah. They've been observing. Can I meet your companion? Then so my Sarah brought him there. Right? And he looked and he stared at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he went behind to see between the shoulder blades, right? and he saw the seal of prophethood. Okay, I'll describe the seal of prophethood now because you guys I forget. The seal of prophethood was basically a, 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 a you would say a lump of flesh, right? This is the size of a pigeon egg, the size of an egg, right? but a lump of flesh that protruded out of his between his shoulder blades. Right, it was said to have light in it. Right, there was a, there was, there was, there was a light in it, and the Sahabas who described it said that it was the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. It was the most beautiful thing they've ever seen, and it was something that was between his shoulder blades. So there were no words on it. Some said there were words on it. Some said there were no words on it. Right, but it was basically it was. It's called the seal of prophethood. It's a stamp, like a seal of prophethood on his body. Right, so that is where you know all of these uh, people of the book, they will look out for it, and when they see it, right, like some of them are even or even uh, described to have kissed it, and right, they touched it and they kissed it, right, because to see that is the last prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So my Sarah saw all of these things. He witnessed all of these things. When they reached Syria, right, my Sarah, right, he observed how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was with his transactions. Because that was the point also, right? To observe how they are with their transactions, and he reported to Sayyidina Khadija. He said, "I have never seen anyone more honest right, than this man Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right? Whatever you, whatever price you give, right? That was the price that he would sell. He would not lower it, nor no increase it. Right? He was, it was exact. He didn't take a single cent." Right from the profits of this of this business, right, and he would tell every buyer, right, if there was any form of deficiency or defect in the product. So he was someone who was extremely, extremely honest. And my son was was blown away because he's never seen throughout his entire travels with, with, with all of the all of the workers of Sayyidina Khadija. He's never seen someone to that extent, right, of honesty. Right, never ever seen that. So so. It, and, and 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 on top of that, right, the amount of profit that they got was way more right, than they ever ever got right, in any of their trips. Right? So the profit was great. At the same time, he was being extremely honest right, in his business dealings. So he went back right, to Mecca with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Oh yeah, are we past the time? You all like you all is decent only. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, let's finish. Uh, it's, there's a lot more. <laughs> I thought we were at 9.15. <laughs> when I looked, it was 9.37. <laughs> okay, so uh, so anyway, he, he went back with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it, he saw the same thing again, lah, the, the cloud and everything. And then when they arrived at, at Mecca, Sayyidina Khadija was waiting. Right, because she kind of felt that it was him. Uh, this is the last prophet. Uh, she kind of felt. So she was watching from afar and she saw the clouds also coming in right, with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when they came, my Sarah took all the prophet, right, paid Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his, his uh, wage and then he took the prophet to the, the house of Sayyidina Khadija. And then he gave, he, he gave her the full report. Right, the full report about this man. And she said to him, I saw, when, when he came in, she said, I saw... Cl- I uh, know a cloud following you wherever you you came when when the caravan was coming in. Then he said that cloud has been with us from the beginning. <laughs> he followed us everywhere <laughs> till the end. He was following us the cloud, right? So he said this this and he and he said that like, Khadija, that's just one of the things I saw. I saw so many amazing things, and in fact, he also he also would hear. The rocks and the trees, you know, give salam to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Assalamu Alaikum Ya Rasulullah. Assalamu Alaikum Ya Nabi Allah. And so he himself also heard right, these things. Right, so it was like things that were beyond. Yeah, right? it was, this is he was young. It happened. Right, it was beyond his belief. Right, it was something so out of ordinary, so like you know, out of ordinary. So he reports to her. Right, she felt in her heart, this is the man. Right, that's him. 
right? He is the last prophet. She actually goes to her cousin to report, <laughs> right? So she goes to her cousin, right? And she tells him everything my Sarah told her. And her cousin said, Waraka, he said that if what my Sarah is saying is true, right? If what he witnessed is true, then Muhammad is the prophet we've been waiting for. He is the one we have been waiting for. Right? And so Sayyidina Khadija made an intention that she's going to marry him. So inshallah, we will speak about the blessed marriage next week. Right? Uh, and then inshallah, we will go into you know details lah about Sayyidina Khadija. Right? So we should write. Uh, there is no... I'm not sure if there is or not. Is there an English book about Sayyidina Khadija? Not yet. <laughs> so the English, the English literature is so, so miskin. <laughs> we don't have enough books. <laughs> right? I would like to write about her. I would love to write about her. Subhanallah. Yes, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam wa sallam. الفاتحة أن الله يرزقنا عمل نافع وعمل خالص وقبول ويسر بذلك قام النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وحسن الدعاني ودلال الهدى ويسر بذلك قام النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وإلى أرواح معالمنا ومشاخنا وإذا ويحقوا علينا وإلى حطر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان الذي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالح حتى توصل بالحق وتواصل بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتو